Today we're going to talk about a few points about indifference curves. Now, in this video, we're going to assume that we're talking about two good things for our, our two products. So we're going to assume that more is better. We're not talking about where one product might be bad. We're not going to talk about the special case of perfect complements or perfect substitutes. I'm going to put a link here to my other video that talks about all kinds of different indifference curves and different special cases like that. Today we're going to look at a few of the finer points about indifference curves. Again, always assuming that we're talking about two goods and that more is always better. What are some things that are helpful that you should know? First, since we're talking about two goods that are more of which are always better than less, then talking about good X and good Y here, just for example, then we're going to be getting happier and happier in this kind of direction, okay? And so getting more X and more Y is always going to make you better off. So as you move further away from the origin, you're going to get happier and happier. And that leads some of us sometimes when we're talking about indifference curves or we're talking about a, a map like this where you have X and Y, sometimes we'll draw a little point up here in the northeast corner and we'll call that a bliss point, where bliss just means the happiest you could possibly be, at least on this graph. So bliss point. Second thing that we want to talk about in difference curves is I just want to remind you one more time what does an indifference curve actually represent. When we draw these things here that kind of look like that, what are we actually talking about? Let me one more time show you the three-dimensional representation here, where an indifference curve comes from. So here we're looking at a utility surface in three dimensions, and we can spin this surface around, we can look at the underneath of the surface. But you, Sometimes people will call this a utility hill. And the idea is that we have two goods here and we have on this axis over here, say soda, and on this axis pretzels. And as we consume more of these things, we're climbing and climbing and climbing up this hill and we're getting more and more utility. And that's this Z axis over here is utility, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. So as we get more utility, we're, we must be consuming more pretzels or more soda in order to get more utility. Now these little lines going around that are what we call level curves, because they are level, uh, represent all the different ways on this surface that we could get a certain amount of utility. This one here looks like it might be for about 30 utils, and this one might be 40 utils, and this one might be 50 utils. And if we take this surface and we turn it to where we're looking straight above it, looking down, then you can see these indifference curve shapes here, okay? So these indifference curves represent where the utility all has the same level, and we call them level curves because they tell us all the points on a hill that would have the same height here for utility. And it just tells us all the different places where we might be able to get that high on the hill. All the different combinations of soda and pretzels, X and Y, that give us that amount of utility. Now one other thing to point out, another interesting thing to make sure you understand about indifference curves while we're on this graph is that there aren't really gaps between indifference curves. What I'm trying to say is there are an infinite number of indifference curves and when we draw a few on a graph like this we leave some space but make sure you understand that there are indifference curves everywhere. So it's not like there's an indifference curve for 20 utils and one for 30 and then there's nothing in between. We can draw as many of these indifference curves as we like. And so let me just do that so you can see how we can keep adding an obnoxious number of these indifference curves if we want to. So on this one I had 10. We could change that to, say, 30 indifference curves. And you see that there are a whole lot more of these indifference curves there. When we turn it up, you can see that they're a lot closer together. 
We could go back and put even more. We could put a hundred in difference curves, or a thousand, or a million. There's, there's really no limit to how many of these we could put. And so don't, don't get fooled into thinking that just because you see a graph with a few indifference curves on it, that that means that there's, there aren't an infinite number of them. So there's an indifference curve for every possible value of utility. 3 and 3.00001, for example. Now the next thing to make sure, if you really want to understand indifference curves, is to make sure that you understand that indifference curves must always slope downward. They must always slope downward. Sometimes when you're in a hurry or you're not really thinking and, and you're asked to draw an indifference curve, you might draw something that looks like this. And that can't be an indifference curve. Again, if we're assuming that X and Y are both good things, so they're both goods, and we're going, just going to assume for simplicity that more x is always better and more y is always better. And why this can't be an indifference curve in that case is if we pick two points here, they can't be, the consumer couldn't be indifferent between these two points because here we have about 6x and about, say, 3.5y. And up here we have 10x and we have about... Uh, 5y, well if these things are both goods and we're happier when we have more x or more y, you can't have this upward sloping part because this you can't be indifferent between this point that has more and this point that has less. And similarly up here we can find a couple of points, right? Here we have 2x and 10y, here we have 3x and 13y. They can't be on the same indifference curve. So if you're really going to draw an indifference curve, you have to make sure in the case where x and y are both goods that you sketch it so that it always has a negative slope everywhere where you're drawing it. Another common question I see on tests or on textbooks is, is, is they'll ask you, is, would it be possible to have an indifference curve that kind of comes down and then hooks like this? Well, of course, you know that can't be true. All right, so next point about indifference curves, just to make sure that you understand, is that you can't have two indifference curves that cross. So let me draw two indifference curves here. So here's indifference curve one that's red. Here's indifference curve two that's green. Let's call the red one indifference curve A. Let's call the green one indifference curve B. Indifference curves can't cross because let's look at a few points on these indifference curves. Look at this point here where they intersect. If these are really two different indifference curves for two different levels of utility, how is it that you could have two different levels of utility here for the same point, right? For exactly the same point right there. That doesn't make any sense. Here's another thing that doesn't make any sense about having indifference curves that cross. If we look at these two points down here, let me draw with a blue dot. So this in point, let's call it point C and this point D. Here, because D has more of X and Y than C, we'd have to conclude that D is better than C. And therefore, we'd have to conclude that indifference curve A must have a higher utility than B. But then we can go over here and look at points E and F. And because F has more of X and Y than E, well, F must be preferred to E. However, that would mean that indifference curve B must be better than, must have a higher level of utility than indifference curve A. But that contradicts what we just said down here. So it just doesn't make any sense at all to have indifference curve cross. Okay. Now, next point about indifference curves is indifference curves cannot be thick. So if we draw an indifference curve, like this pink one here, that doesn't make any sense that the indifference curve is thick. Again, using some similar kind of logic to what we've said before, each indifference curve is assuming that 
we're talking about a certain level of utility, say maybe u equals 10. We're getting 10 utils there. And that you're indifferent anywhere along that indifference curve. However, if an indifference curve was thick, that means we could have two different points like this on the same indifference curve. Well, again, this point, if we're assuming that x and y are goods, this point must be preferred to this lower point where you get less of both x and y. Uh, one more thing is, let's just review, because we, we can't say this enough when we're talking about indifference curves, is, you know, of course it's got to slope negatively, slope downward everywhere. You always have to make sure when you're talking about indifference curves, make sure you really think about and understand what the slope of an indifference curve means. The slope of that indifference curve, let me draw one that, that really changes slope a little bit more obviously here. Slope of that indifference curve tells you the MRS, the marginal rate of substitution. And that marginal rate of substitution tells you your willingness to, to trade X for Y. Stop popping up there, you evil box. The marginal rate of substitution, you can see that the slope here of this curve is changing. It's very steep here. It's kind of, you know, in between here, and it's very flat over here. That tells us that your willingness to trade x's for y's is changing as we move along this curve. So being steep over here tells us that you are willing to trade willing to trade a lot of y, uh, a lot of y, for one more x. Let's suppose that over here, I'm not, I'm not going to calculate it, let's suppose that the slope was 5, actually minus 5, right? What that would mean is that you'd be willing to trade 5 y's in order to get one more x over here. Why might that be the case? Well, it might be the case because here you don't have much x and you have a lot of y, so you'd be willing to trade a lot of y in order to get one more x. That makes perfect sense. Down here in the middle, you've got more x. You have less y. So here the slope is smaller. The slope here might be minus 1. The marginal rate of substitution, usually we talk about the absolute value, so the marginal rate of substitution would be 1, and that would be telling us that you would be willing in this region to trade 1 y. Not a lot of y, but you'd be willing to trade 1 y in order to get one more x. And then down in this region, it's very flat. The slope might only be one quarter, so that tells us that you're willing to trade only one quarter of a y to get one more x. Why? We well, already have a lot of x, and you hardly have any y, so it makes sense that as you move along the x-axis and you get more and more x along an indifference curve and less and less y, that that slope is going to get flatter and flatter, that the marginal rate of substitution is going to become lower and lower. Those are some of the finer points about indifference curves that everybody needs reminding of every once in a while. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll be happy to try to get back to you. Good luck studying your microeconomics, guys.